Early happy President's Day. I'm Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, and your co-host this evening, along with my good colleague, Brooke Clement, who is Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. During Black History Month, the Ford highlights the contributions of African Americans to building our nation's infrastructure and wealth and civic ethos. This evening, Brooke and I are pleased to introduce you to Dr. David Hamilton Golland. Dr. Golland is a professor of history, coordinator of humanities, and president of the faculty senate at Governor State University. He holds a PhD from the City University of New York and an MA from the University of Virginia, and he is the author of two books, Constructing Affirmative Action, which came out in 2011, and his more recently published book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, Arthur Fletcher and the Conundrum of the Black Republican, which came out in 2019, published by Kansas University Press. Now, I'd bet Arthur Fletcher was the most important civil rights leader you've never heard of, yet he made an indelible mark. Consider, Fletcher was the first black player for the Baltimore Colts, an advisor to four presidents, the father of affirmative action, and the person who coined the motto of the United Negro College Fund, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Those of you who have followed President Ford's career may know that Arthur Fletcher served as deputy assistant to the president for urban affairs. Now this evening, our event will unfold as follows. Dr. Golland will tell us about Arthur Fletcher's remarkable life. Following his 15 to 20 minute presentation, Brooke Clement will moderate the discussion and field your questions. So if you wanna ask Dr. Golland a question, locate the toolbar on your screen and start composing the question right away to get in the queue. At about the one hour mark, I will come back to wrap up. So Dr. Golland and Director Brooke Clement, welcome. Thank you, Gleaves. Thank you, Gleaves, for that wonderful introduction. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Golland on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford Library and Museum this evening. David, let's begin the program with a brief history on Arthur Fletcher for those who aren't as well versed in his, in his historical significance. While Dr. Golland is speaking, if anyone at home has any questions, feel free to use the question feature on your screen. I will incorporate those questions into our discussion. Dr. Golland, the virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you, Brooke, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be back at the Ford, even if virtually. I've been looking forward to this uh, really for a couple of years now uh, since the book was in press. And uh, uh, I remember very fondly uh, the time that I spent doing research in Ann Arbor. And so even though we can't be together in person, it is certainly a pleasure to be with you this evening uh, in this way. Arthur Fletcher, uh, like Gleaves said, gosh, uh, probably the most important civil rights leader that you've never heard of. Um, born uh, almost literally on the wrong side of the tracks in the American Southwest, specifically Fort Huachuca in Arizona, uh, raised in a variety of homes um, uh, by a single mother, uh, occasionally by his aunt, by uh, grandparents um, uh, all over the Southwest from uh, Los Angeles, uh, Watts neighborhood, all the way over to Oklahoma City, and then ultimately in his teen years, um, by his adopted uh, stepfather, um, Cotton Fletcher, a master farrier in the U.S. Army, uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, the African-American soldiers in the Army in the 1930s at the end of this uh, period when we refer to uh, African-American soldiers as Buffalo Soldiers, uh, raised at that point uh, uh, in Junction City, Kansas, uh, near Fort Riley, uh, which is about a, an hour west of Topeka, and in turn about another hour west uh, from Kansas City. Um, uh, takes the name of his stepfather and um, uh, sort of uh, gets himself in gear, as it were, uh, literally uh, in terms of his football. Um, he called that his gear, but he had had some rough patches uh, during his early uh, childhood, um, as, as you can imagine, and ultimately as a result of football and um, kind of a, a stern stepfather, uh, Arthur Fletcher, uh, the young teen Arthur Fletcher, uh, becomes a standout uh, academic, uh, a standout student in high school, and a standout on the gridiron, uh, 
and uh, becomes the first um, African American to be an all state on the all state team in Kansas for football. Um, goes off and fights in World War II, making it all the way over to Europe. Uh, he was in the second round of the D Day invasion, so it wasn't actually on D-Day. Uh, he went over when the shores were basically safe, um, uh, advancing all the way up to the just the other side of the German border, where he took what was probably friendly fire uh, in the abdomen and, and uh, while he was under the command of General Patton and uh, found his way back stateside from hospital to hospital. Uh, and uh, after his discharge in uh, 1945, uh, went looking for, because he had healed, went looking for a football scholarship uh, so that he could go to college, ultimately set in, settling in at Washburn University, what they call small ball. Um, uh, no uh, reflection on the players, of course, uh, only on the, the, uh, the level of the league. And um, uh, he played with Washburn and was a, was a, a standout star uh, at Washburn for all four years, uh, making the paper uh, not just the local college paper, but uh, Topeka daily papers as well. And um, uh, working multiple jobs, point he's married, he has uh, three and then four, and ultimately after he graduated from college, five children, uh, getting involved in politics in the state of Kansas because Washburn is in Topeka, which is the capital. He found odd jobs opening doors, um, literally being the doorman uh, at the Capitol building, working at uh, uh, the Jayhawk Hotel as a waiter, um, hanging out with the politicos, making connections that he didn't re even realize he was making, didn't even want to make. It was just at that time, he was just trying to earn enough money to keep food on the table while pursuing uh, his college career that he thought would lead to a football career. And indeed, for a brief period, it did. Um, his his brief professional football career began with uh, the Los Angeles Rams during their exhibition season in 1950, uh, at which point at the end of the season, he was wavered, as it's called, and let go from the team. He didn't get into the regular season with the Rams, but he was picked up uh, by uh, a team that the Rams had beaten in an exhibition game in San Antonio uh, that August, beaten pretty badly, I, as, as I recall. I'm not reading directly from the book, but the score was something like uh, a lopsided 76 to zero or something along those lines. Uh, but he had been, he had, he had rushed a certain number of yards and uh, the Baltimore folks, Baltimore Colts came calling. Baltimore at that point had not had an African American player. They were one of the last three or four teams at that point in uh, the, I guess at that point there were two or three football leagues still hadn't quite merged into what we today consider the NFL. Um, and he therefore integrated uh, Baltimore football uh, as the first African American cult um, and uh, played a couple of games and, uh, and then uh, just uh, didn't make it. And that's the way things go at prof in professional sports. Uh, the fantastic sometimes aren't as fantastic uh, at the pro level as they were in college. Um, after a couple of games uh, where he dropped balls on the field and that sort of thing, he was fired um, conveniently when they were back in California, where at that point his mother had settled and his family was living. So he and his family returned to Kansas. He got a job as a school teacher and then started working his way up in Kansas politics, ultimately supporting uh, a fellow by the name of, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm blocking on his name, but uh, um, uh, whew, um, in any event, uh, the, <laughs> he supported a candidate, a liberal Republican candidate for governor of Kansas. Uh, and um, at this point in 1954, he uh, finds himself on the winning team uh, for the first time in a while and um, becomes, uh, I guess it was deputy commissioner for highways or deputy transportation commissioner, uh, some title along those lines, uh, which turned out to be very, very lucrative. Uh, it seems like there were a lot of, uh, as, as we know, there were a lot of interstates being built around that time uh, all over the country. But Kansas is uh, pretty well positioned um, being sort of, uh, he, he managed to um, ingratiate himself with uh, various military commanders in the state that wanted the highways to come near the posts and, uh, and in the surrounding states as well, uh, set up a used car business, uh, engaged in a number of things that today we would probably consider rather unethical for someone in, in public service. At the time, it was all perfectly legal. Uh, and, um, and yet when 
uh, his favorite candidate, the governor, ultimately lost his reelection bid. Uh, Arthur Fletcher found himself out of work and uh, back at the bottom of the totem pole once again. Indeed, the, the folks in the party blamed uh, Art Fletcher uh, for a number of things that led to the defeat of the governor and ultimately led to a Democrat being uh, elected governor of Kansas, a Democrat who, as I recall, then became the first two-term Democratic uh, uh, governor in Kansas in decades. And so um, uh, it was rather an embarrassment for those people who had surrounded the, the losing candidate. Uh, makes his way out to California. Uh, and at this point, his wife is having psychological issues. Um, he goes from job to job, but continues to be rather an uh, un un underemployed um, uh, person. And he's doing the best he can, uh, but uh, the word is uh, continuing, continually making it out to California where he's trying to get jobs uh, that he has this past in Kansas that perhaps he uh, might not be so proud of and that perhaps he shouldn't be someone who should be hired. He's trying to become a school teacher. He gets a job at a junior high school. He gets a job at a high school. Ultimately, these jobs fall through. Um, and uh, then in October of 1960, sadly, uh, his wife commits suicide. Uh, she jumped off the Bay Bridge uh, in San Francisco and uh, left Arthur Fletcher a single parent uh, of five, uh, ranging five children ranging in age at that point from uh, 10 to 18, if my math is uh, uh, too far off. And then it's a, it's rather a remarkable story. From 1960 to 1968, he goes from being this underemployed single parent, um, uh, living and raising his children uh, in the ghetto of uh, Berkeley, California, uh, on the other side of Telegraph Avenue over there, uh, to in 1969, uh, being a member of the Nixon administration. Uh, and, that, and that's sort of a, a remarkable decade. Uh, in the book, I call it the moonshot. Uh, it's, the, it's the name of the chapter is moonshot. Uh, obviously, I'm taking a cue from what else was going on in the 1960s. The United States was preparing actu an actual moonshot to put men on the moon for the first time. And that was just sort of this pie in the sky, incredible thing for most Americans that we're going to put people on the moon. Someone's gonna walk on that big hunk of Swiss cheese up there. And it was also uh, just as incredible if you had asked Arthur Fletcher in 1960, what are you gonna be doing in 1969? He never in the world would have said, I'm going to be the assistant secretary um, for the I'm going to be responsible for uh, around 100, the, the labor and, and wage standards for about 100, you know, 100,000 people. Um, and, uh, and yet that's exactly what happened. Uh, he left the Bay Area. He went up to a place called Pasco, Washington, where he became a community organizer. Uh, he remarried, uh, stabilized his life. And um, in his capacity as a community organizer in Pasco, ran for city council in 1967, becoming the first African-American, one of two at the same time, uh, first African-American to be elected to any city council in the state of Washington uh, in that year. Uh, the following year, having made friends with the incumbent governor who needed someone to run, uh, run against the incumbent Democratic um, a lieutenant governor, uh, he ran for lieutenant governor and won the Republican nomination. He actually won every single county in the state of Washington, which is a particularly remarkable feat, uh, considering that at that time in the state of Washington, uh, John Birchers far outnumbered African Americans uh, in the Republican Party. Lost in the general election in 1968, an incredibly close race. Um, 60,000 votes divided him from the incumbent. Um, uh, remarkable showing. And uh, during the course of the campaign, he was introduced to Richard Nixon uh, in Miami at the convention um, at, the, at the RNC. And uh, Nixon was looking for someone uh, who could uh, help him uh, kind of uh, uh, seem a little bit like a civil rights president. It was the era in which presidents did not, uh, you know, Nixon did not want to seem callous when it came to the issue of civil rights. And Arthur Fletcher had been by then espousing uh, an idea of self-help civil rights that Nixon seized upon. And uh, Arthur Fletcher went to work for uh, the late George Shultz, who just died this week, uh, sadly. Um, uh, George Shultz at that time uh, was named uh, uh, Secretary of Labor and Arthur Fletcher as Secretary of Labor. Uh, 
uh, which is about two rungs down. There's also an undersecretary above the assistant secretary, uh, but he was assistant secretary for wage and labor standards for a couple of years during which he pushed the uh, first major federal affirmative action program uh, where he attempted to integrate the building construction trades all over the country with what something that was called the Philadelphia plan, which goals for African Americans and other minorities seeking jobs in the construction uh, industry. Uh, but he made enough enemies uh, among the union leadership um, uh, in his couple of years at, uh, with the Nixon administration, with the Labor Department, that ultimately he became a little too hot to handle, and Nixon moved him over to the United Nations, where he met uh, George H.W. Bush, who would become his most uh, important and long-lasting political friend. Um, uh, George Bush would later give him a job at the RNC uh, when, when Bush was the chair of the RNC. And um, after a year at the United Nations, Fletcher got a job um, uh, at the United Negro College, where he said he launched that famous phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, it didn't come whole cloth out of his own mind. There were various versions that were being batted around the ad council. Um, and uh, and uh, Arthur Fletcher just kind of solidified the final version that we all know very well today, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And ultimately he was fired from that job after about a year um, because of his closeness in all likelihood, his closeness to President Agnew. Uh, when Nixon resigned and uh, Gerald Ford became president, uh, Fletcher made an all out push to get back into the government. He used every connection he could possibly think of. Everyone who he knew, who he knew knew uh, Gerald Ford or who had a connection to Gerald Ford. He asked them to write letters. He asked them to call up uh, their connections to try to get him in. And ultimately, I guess the Ford administration was about a two and a half year uh, presidency. It took him about a year and a half to get in. And so basically calendar 1976 is when Arthur Fletcher worked for the Ford administration. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was still a time of tokenism. There was basically one uh, African-American top-level advisor to the president. There had been one under Nixon. Now there was one uh, under Ford. And when that individual uh, resigned in January of 76, Arthur Fletcher got the call. And he pretty much spent the year uh, working on the Ford re-election campaign, uh, running all over the country, trying to drum up African-American votes, particularly for Jerry Ford's, uh, I, I shouldn't call it the re-election campaign, actually. Um, <laughs> that is the election campaign of Jerry Ford. And uh, spent a lot of time in California, of course, because that was where he had a lot of experience, uh, primarily trying to make Ronald Reagan worried that he wouldn't win the state or, or force Reagan's campaign to put more money into, uh, into the state uh, to fight any efforts um, uh, to win the state for Ford. Um, and then uh, in the general election, again in California and all over the country, uh, in a final push trying to win Texas. Uh, and as we know, it was ultimately a very close race um, between uh, Gerald Ford and, um, and Jimmy Carter. And a couple of states uh, here or there, I did the math once where it was New York and Mississippi could have tilted the difference. Uh, so um, Nonetheless, most of the people on this call know probably far more about the 1976 presidential election than yours truly. So um, I'll move on. And of course, in January of 1977, everyone in the administration resigned, including Arthur Fletcher. Uh, he left and uh, then resurfaced in 1978, running for mayor of Washington, D.C., of all things, and did fairly well for a Republican, uh, got about 28 percent of the vote uh, in what was the first open, fully open election for mayor of D.C., uh, running against Marion Barry uh, and Marion Barry, that was Marion Barry's first race and Barry won, of course, as we know. And um, Fletcher then uh, campaigned for Ronald Reagan in 1980, uh, somewhat half-heartedly, and uh, ultimately did not get uh, an administration post in the first years of the Reagan administration, although his wife did. Uh, his wife worked for um, Nancy Reagan uh, in the East Wing. And Arthur Fletcher ultimately became uh, the vice chair of the Pennsylvania Avenue uh, Development uh, Corporation, I'm trying to figure out, remember what that C stood for, whether it was council or corporation or commission, but I think it's corporation, uh, and worked on uh, um, setting up, uh, making sure there was affirmative action in the construction of monuments along Pennsylvania Avenue during the 1980s. And then his friend, George Bush, finally got elected president on the third try. Uh, 
uh, or was it technically the second try, uh, 1980 and then 1988. And uh, Fletcher uh, then found himself in early 89 with a very good friend in the White House and hoping for an appointment, which he ultimately got. He became uh, the United States, um, uh, he became the chairman of the United States Civil Rights Commission, uh, a post he held uh, through to the end, pretty much the end of 1993, uh, when uh, President Clinton named Mary Frances Berry, Professor Berry, as chairman, chairperson of that commission. And Fletcher uh, left us in 2005, uh, died of um, what was his third heart attack, and uh, I guess I've been working on his biography ever since. So, uh, Brooke, I'll turn it right on over back to you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's just a fascinating life. And as you said at the beginning, it's one that most people are not aware of. And I, I really thank you for, for joining us this evening to kind of give us this background information on this, I mean, really fascinating figure. The, amount, the number of people that he crossed paths with and um, from Patton onward, like it's just, it's an amazing story. Um, I want to remind people that the question that you can submit questions over the Q and A um, tab there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have gotten a couple of questions in, but before I get going with those questions, uh, Dr. Golland, what was what was most surprising to you as you did your research on this project? Thank you, Brooke, for that question. This being my second book, I, I, I've spent most of my scholarly career doing research in air-conditioned, clean archives, including the one uh, you help run. Uh, presidential archives around the country, a couple out west in California, and uh, of course the big one in College Park, National Archives, and the other one not far from there, the Library of Congress uh, Manuscript Reading Room. And these are um, very quiet, very carefully maintained places. And when I uh, discovered, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word discovered because I kind of feel like, you know, Christopher Columbus shows up and he tells the people there that they've been discovered. Uh, I did not discover the Arthur Fletcher papers, but for me, I discovered them. When I came across the Arthur Fletcher papers through the help of Arthur's son, Paul Fletcher, who uh, still has them, um, uh, I went down to his home in Hollywood, Florida, and he showed me the papers, which were in the back of an 18-wheel tractor trailer um, in these uh, sort of moldering boxes. Uh, they had survived a couple of floods in Arthur's home in Washington, D.C. over the years. And um, just sort of that level of the work surprised me, uh, because up until that time, again, it had always been sort of these very well-controlled archival experiences. And now, Paul and I went through all of these boxes, literally page by page, and digitized the entire collection over the course of about three, three weeks in very, very high temperatures down there in, in, in Florida. I'd say that was the most surprising thing uh, about this project. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question from Mary who asks, what drove your interest in Arthur Fletcher? Thank you, Mary. Um, this, uh, well, Arthur Fletcher was an important figure in my first book, Constructing Affirmative Action, which, <coughs> excuse me, basically focuses on the Philadelphia Plan. Uh, the 1969 program actually was built out of a Johnson administration program from 68 uh, that um, ultimately Arthur Fletcher pushes into, uh, he, he executes this program to, uh, to integrate the, the skilled building trades uh, around the country. And I, I guess what, what had originally, so that's kind of how I, for, for myself, discovered Arthur Fletcher and decided to make a project out of uh, his life. Um, uh, sort of writ large, though, one could ask, you know, uh, what interests me about African-American history? What interests civil rights history? And I, um, so I, I was initially interested in uh, doing work on industrialism during slavery. And my master's work was um, on the, they called it integration, which is kind of a, a weird use of the word, uh, but the antebellum integration of slaves into factories and factories that would own slaves and that were uh, um, 
that, that used slaves as part of their workforce, owned or hired slaves. Uh, and ultimately, as I got deeper into graduate school, began pursuing my dissertation, I became more interested in 20th century civil rights uh, topics, and then kind of fell onto this Philadelphia plan topic, which ultimately led to Art Fletcher. I'm just grateful that I, I, I came across him uh, because it's just been such a rewarding pro, uh, pro uh, such a rewarding process over the years. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Edward says, as a high school teacher, he's interested in hearing about the boycott of his high school yearbook. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Edward. Um, and thank you, Edward, for reading the book. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, in, uh, in senior year, Fletcher picked up the mantle. Uh, that had been going on for a couple of years of this boycott uh, with and they the previous years uh, students the previous seniors had not been successful what the this integrated high school in Junction City Kansas what they were doing was they were segregating their yearbook I mean it, it's just sometimes it's amazing to look at the way uh, de jure segregation played out in real life uh, 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 during during these years, the 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 real creativity, frankly, that segregationists came up with to find ways to separate themselves by race is is uh, sometimes it's mind boggling. The yearbook had came to the portraits of the seniors. It had all of the white students first, and then it had the African American students, and then it had the one Asian American young woman at the very end. Why they had to have set it's. You know, the, the logic of segregation never seemed to make any, I mean, it, it, there's huge holes in it to begin with, but when they have a logic of segregation, why it extends to where the yearbook portraits are uh, was just sort of baffling um, to me when I came across this story. Um, but it, it's an incredibly insulting thing, obviously. And, uh, and Fletcher, here he was, the star of the football team. In other words, what have I, you know, look at the things that I've done for you Oh, Junction City High School, and here you are sort of snubbing me, just like you snubbed the past two years of African American seniors. Well, we're not going to sit for portraits, and, um, and and indeed they did not. Finally, in the middle of the war, um, the the high school decided to integrate the, the yearbook, and uh, so I mean, you think when you hear the phrase "integrate the yearbook," you think it's we're talking about the staff of the yearbook, as opposed to where the portraits go. I mean, again, it's just uh, baffling. Uh, how they came up with this segregation. Um, and uh, when Fletcher came back to Junction City, uh, walking with his cane fresh out of the hospital from his wound, um, the principal jumped up out of the car and saw him on the street, threw him into the car and said, come on, I got to show you something. Drove him back to the high school, went into his office, opened up the 1945 yearbook and said, look, you won. And there, there they all were in 1945, the portraits integrated. At some level, though, it's like, well, okay, you can do that. You could have done that from the beginning. What does that actually do? Does this actually change anything? And I think at some, you know, it's part of what eventually gets to Arthur Fletcher of, we need to go for the bigger things. Uh, we, we can't be distracted by these little things. Uh, these little things, we, you know, we need to fight against them. But it's in the end, even when we win, the difference that's made is not as important as the real stuff, which are getting jobs, ultimately, getting jobs on an equal basis. Mm -hmm. Well, you just mentioned his injury from World War II, and we have a question from Robert, who um, asks, what was the circumstance that led uh, ones to believe it was friendly fire? Right, so um, it's not marked as friendly fire. And um, there were, as I recall from the story of it, and I read uh, things like, I mean, I hear, I've heard Arthur Fletcher in various interviews and I've read him uh, write about this stuff uh, as he's recollected the story. And then I've read sort of act, after action reports from his lieutenant, uh, we're talking about this stuff and, and the location of the wound. And of course his VA records, uh, which are limited because there was a fire. The, the folks who work at the archive are all aware of the fire, 1970 something, um, uh, fire in St. Louis. Um, we lost so many of our um, of our VA records because of that personnel records. 
Um, but the limited records that do exist, uh, first of all, he wasn't given a Purple Heart. And so there, there seems to be some sort of intimation that it might have been self-inflicted. Um, but it certainly wasn't. From everything that I've learned about Arthur Fletcher, it, it was not a self-inflicted wound. Um, that's the sort of thing that happened uh, throughout World War II, where African-American soldiers, every time they turned around, uh, the people in, in positions of bureaucratic power were taking actions to make them seem less heroic. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess the most famous uh, of these is where General Mark Clark, um, who's I think his grandson still writes op-eds from time to time nowadays. Uh, General Mark Clark was in command. Uh, he was, I guess, two levels above the unit level command of this African-American um, uh, company in Italy that was incredibly distinguished. And yet every single time the reports came to his desk, he would just X this stuff out. No way. Uh, no way my African-American soldiers could have been doing this heroic stuff. And so what happens here is that um, we know there's a certain amount of friendly fire that is taking place in any war. We know there's a certain amount of racism that's prevalent in the armed forces still today, but more so then. And we know that everyone is armed, <laughs> uh, to, to put it bluntly. And so it's, it's Arthur Fletcher's theory that he was probably wounded as a result of friendly fire. And I can, based on what else we know, I can support that theory to the extent that I'm willing to say it may have been the case, which is, I think, the way I put it. Um, but it's not, the, it's, I can't draw that conclusion uh, based, uh, there's not enough evidence to support that conclusion as I would not write it as fact in the book. Um, it's just one of the possibilities and it's certainly what he thought. Uh, but, but beyond that, I guess that's where we're at on, on that. And that's, that's one of the things about history is that, you know, we do our best to gather as much possible evidence uh, in the end. Um, and we, you know, we interrogate our sources. And then in the end, we, we try to draw reasonable conclusions based on the preponderance of evidence. If we can, I think it behooves us to write that we couldn't but here's what may have happened, right? A lot of historians I think don't like to write about what may have happened, but I sort of tend to put it out there. These are the possibilities. This is the evidence that leads us to these different possibilities and the reader can now decide. Excellent, thank you. I'm sorry, but <laughs> wouldn't no, it be great okay. if, someone, if someone were to read and you know, some uh, you know, nonagenarian were to call me up and say, oh yeah, I shot him, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, unfortunately, you know, that's not the way historical research works. So, you know, <laughs> um, so we have a couple of people who have asked about how Arthur Fletcher became a Republican and expounding on that, like, did he ever consider leaving the Republican Party towards the end of his life? Yes. Uh, he, well, when he became a Republican in the 1950s, it was, there was nothing remarkable about that. It was very much the party of Lincoln in the 1950s. In fact, at the end of the 1950s, um, uh, at, the RNC, the, at the RNC of 1960, which nominated uh, Richard Nixon for president for the first time when he was still vice president, the, um, the, the platform of the Republican party was stronger on civil rights than the platform of the Democratic party. Now that's obviously changed significantly um, in the past 50 years. Uh, but at the time, uh, the major reason for this was that the Democratic Party had this huge Southern wing that had been solidly Democratic since before the Civil War, frankly. Um, and it was the Southern white wing of the Democratic Party that were being reelected and reappointed to their party posts year after year, decade after decade they excluded African-Americans from the franchise, from the vote um, throughout the South. And in Kansas, the Democrats tended to be like those Dixiecrats, as we call them. So it was a perfectly natural thing for him to do. It was also where his connections were, the connections that he made back when he was in Washburn, again, opening the front door of the Capitol building professionally. 
uh, serving people at the Jayhawk Hotel. And it's where he had his earliest success uh, in Kansas politics. Then he found in the 1960s, um, increasingly, he was a big fish in a smaller and smaller pond. And that is, that's a recipe for success, let's face it. Uh, there was less competition for him. Uh, you know, um, it was still not the way it is today. I mean, someone like Ed Brooke of Massachusetts could still run for and win a Senate seat as a Republican in the 1960s. Uh, that's, and I guess he won re-election in the 1970s, much less possible today. And then of course, when Fletcher went to Washington, his connections continued. Um, being a Republican where he was in Washington in Southeast Washington, being a Republican was what led to his political success. At that point, being an African-American was the hurdle that he needed to overcome uh, politically. Now, did he ever consider leaving? I have no, I have no record of him. He has never written uh, nor said in an interview that I'm aware of. And in terms of what I've read about him, that's we're talking 300,000 pieces of paper <laughs> um, uh, where he does not consider it. I talk about it in the book about, you know, so I sort of conjecture what his life of the mind might have been on this topic. Uh, especially when we get to the point where Reagan is the standard bearer of the party. Uh, and Reagan is not, uh, he's not even Nixonian in terms of his civil rights um, uh, bona fides. Uh, and ultimately, the Reagan administration was disastrous for civil rights uh, for this country. And so uh, that was the point where if he was going to go, he should have gone. And yet, uh, his good friend had just become vice president. And so, and his good friend, I guess it was 1983 or 1984, even though Fletcher didn't yet have an appointment in the Reagan administration, Bush took him on, a, on an African tour. Bush took him to seven or eight countries uh, in straight across and back across Africa and a couple countries in the Caribbean. Uh, that's not a connection you throw away uh, willy nilly. And then of course we, and I do talk about this a little bit in the book, he could look at who had changed parties, white and black, and see what their experience had been. And uh, I guess the most prominent person was a white person, uh, Governor Connolly of Texas, who was considered to have been probably passed over for the vice presidency in 76 uh, of all dates, since we're talking forward here, um, because of this loyalty question. Uh, Fletcher also, something about football players, they're team players. And the party is a team. Nowadays, it feels like they're nations almost. Um, uh, and it's been a rough year for those of us who'd like to see the parties be more like teams and less like nations. Uh, but it's been a rough five years in that regard. But for Fletcher, the being on the Republican Party was being on a team. Being an American was his nation. And he was not going to betray his team. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's just what he learned from all of his years. In, in sports. So I think there's a lot of things that were going into that, but ultimately I have no evidence that he openly considered it. Well, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I have a question in terms of, you brought up integration and segregation, and I found it interesting that he has a connection to the Brown v. Board decision. So I thought maybe you could expound a little on that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, Brooke. Yeah, I guess I did sort of jump right over that when I talked about Kansas years. So uh, he knew the Scott brothers, and um, he was rather close with their father. Uh, I guess his name was Elijah Scott. Um, and the Scott brothers were the lead, plan the, play the lead attorneys for Oliver Brown uh, and the other plaintiffs in Topeka. And for those of you who don't know, the reason why it's called Brown versus Board is because Supreme Court cases, I guess all legal cases, are named uh, in the, you know, they arrange the name of the names of the plaintiffs and defendants if there's more than one of those alphabetically. And Brown is the highest letter in the alphabet, uh, or B is the highest letter in the alphabet of all of the plaintiffs. And ultimately, there were plaintiffs from all across the South in this case. But the case that begins in Topeka is, uh, is the one that's initially named for Oliver Brown. And, um, and his daughter Linda. Uh, 
Uh, and so he knew those lawyers. He was apparently part of some early discussions. He was a father while he was in college and the Scott brothers went to Washburn Law School while Art was an undergrad at Washburn. But remember because of his military years, he was not an 18 to 21 year old undergrad. He was a uh, 21 to 25 year old undergrad. And so he was a similar age to some of the people in law school. Although of course, a lot of them had been in the war as well and they were a couple years old. But uh, they, there was an African-American uh, Legion, uh, what is it called? The Foreign, the, uh, the Legion Hall, what are those things called? I forget those clubs where the veterans get together. Um, and there was one of these in Topeka that was for black veterans. And apparently he had a few conversations with them about the issue. He himself put his kids, because his wife was Catholic, he put his kids in the Catholic school, uh, which was also segregated, but it was whites and blacks were allowed in the Catholic school and um, Latinos, different Catholic school. That's how they segregated the Catholic schools. Um, but he was aware of all of this and uh, early on, but he was not in Kansas during the major planning sessions that were taking place in 1950. In fact, in the fall of 1950, when the, the one big planning session took place uh, for Brown, uh, he was off playing football for the Colts. And so he loved to tell the story about how he had been one of the leaders in Brown versus Board. board. Sometimes his, uh, <laughs> his reputation, his reputation went a little bit farther than his actual past. And a, a lot of my task was to kind of uh, sort between these grand of his background and what actually happened. Um, and sometimes he, you know, so uh, he, he would, he often claimed a bit more involvement uh, in Brown versus Board than he actually had, but he knew all the people and he was, you know, he was part of the community uh, of educated African-Americans in Topeka during those years. Thank you. So this is a Ford Library and Museum and Foundation event. So let's have some questions for about um, his relationship with Ford. Uh, Claire asks, uh, she's curious to know what the relationship may have been like between him and President Ford. Any idea what that was like, how they viewed one another? And then she also asks, how successful was Fletcher in persuading black voters in the 76 Ford campaign? So um, Cheney and I think it was Cannon uh, were the go-betweens. When Fletcher came in in January of 76, he wanted to be, and who doesn't when you're working in the White House? Not that I have any personal experience, but I mean, I've watched the West Wing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I've read a lot of these documents and, and just to be more serious about it. Uh, but when you're working there, you wanna be someone with the closest access to the principal, to the president. And why, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, but that, uh, so when he comes in and he has this, this great program and he writes it all up, here's what I want to do. And every week I want to do this. And I want to be given all these reports to the president. And I want him to be telling me how to go out into the community and, you know, working his agenda and all this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks great on paper, but it wasn't what actually happened. Uh, I, I don't mean to besmirch Jerry Ford. Um, in fact, in terms of personalities and competencies, he's, he's very high on my list of the 44 at this point, uh, 45 people who have become president in terms of um, their qualifications for the job and the way they handled the stresses. Um, but it was a token appointment. I mean, let's, let's just face it. I mean, he was there so that the president could have an African-American advisor. Um, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's hard for us to understand um, when we expect far more, we, you know, we, we expect far more uh, equity uh, in our workplace, uh, especially in the highest workplace in the land. Um, but uh, that was not the case then. And so his, he certainly, and I talk about this, I guess I do a page and a half of comparing Jerry Ford and Art Fletcher. I mean, they had so many things in common in terms of being uh, college football players, and in terms of being college football coaches, uh, although frankly, you know, um, there were things that Jerry Ford was able to accomplish as a white 
uh, person that Art Fletcher was not able to comp accomplish as an African American. And uh, one of those was being, um, uh, being a head coach of a college football team. And so, um, so that, that, that's kind of the extent of it. And we have some nice, you know, the president writes nice letters. I mean, but he's got people to do that. I mean, but, you know, when he accepts Art's resignation, I guess, I, I think I still remember the date, January 17th, 1977. For some reason, the 17th pops out at me. Um, and I don't have the source in front of me. But I read the letter uh, accepting the resignation, and it was, it was warm. And, um, and there's almost a sense of personal connection there. But again, they have professional people who write these things, and I, I wouldn't go too far with that. Um, they had known each other during Ford's congressional career, and Fletcher had spoken up for Ford on the civil rights issue when the Senate was, uh, or I guess both houses were reviewing Ford for the vice presidency after the Agnew resignation, which would have been October or November of 73. Uh, and Fletcher says, look, we can't get past the votes that Ford has made that are contrary to civil rights but we also shouldn't hold him to any higher standard than we're holding anybody else. And, you know, and it's, uh, but, so the second part of the question was to what extent was he successful getting African-Americans to vote for Ford? And I have no evidence that he was successful at, at all <laughs> getting African-Americans to vote for Ford. Um, I think that knowing what I know about that election, you know, and that's from a number of books that covered the election directly, uh, as well as the primary sources that I've read from the election. The African-American Republicans voting in those primaries were probably already far more inclined to vote for Jerry Ford than they were for Ronald Reagan. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know that he really made a dent in that regard. And then in the general election, uh, I think that he, uh, he probably didn't make much of a dent there either. I, I hate to be sort of answering the question with he's not an important figure because uh, it kind of sounds like that. Um, but I think you never know how an election is going to turn out. And you want to pull out all the stops, to use a musical metaphor. And Arthur Fletcher was one of the stops. Um, having an African-American Republican who is well credentialed on civil rights going out into the African-American community on, in support of President Ford, both in the long drawn out um, uh, nomination battle, which you know most of the callers, not call it, most of the folks watching this webinar know, lasted until like day two or day three of the convention. Nobody knew who the nominee was going to be at that point. Um, uh, and then of course, in the general election, having him out there, how could Ford not? Um, you know, th that's, it was just smart, smart politics. But did it make a difference? I think if Ford had won, we would be looking a lot more closely at why he won, and perhaps we would be able to make some connection with regards to that. But as we know, he didn't. So uh, I would say that Fletcher had much of an impact there. Thank you for that. Um, I, I also would like to ask the question in terms of the civil unrest that we as a nation have seen unfold over the last year. Where do you think, or what do you think Arthur Fletcher's position would be on, on those this as a topic? Well, Fletcher absolutely supported peaceful protest. And, uh, he writes and talks a lot about this during the 1960s. He, um, he sounds very much like Dr. King in that he is warning the powers that be, the political, um, uh, the political machinery, uh, that if you don't deal with us, the so-called responsible civil rights leaders, we're going to let loose. I mean, you, they never actually said that, but you know, you, you're going to have to worry about the irresponsible civil rights leaders. Um, he would never, I think, publicly say it in those ways. I mean, he wouldn't talk about, uh, say, Malcolm X or the Nation of Islam as irresponsible. From Fletcher's but but Fletcher was, Fletcher was a suit and tie, uh, sort of civil rights leader. He um, 
he felt that he could make the biggest difference in the boardroom, uh, arguing, you know, he, he wanted to be an insider so that he could argue for civil rights from inside the room. Um, but he supported uh, the, you know, the outdoor movement, I guess you would say. He did not support anything that went beyond nonviolent protest. And so if he were alive and, you know, we're not really supposed to get into these sort of counterfactuals, but um, I think he would have generally supported the protests that, um, that took place last summer after the murder of George Floyd. Um, he was aware, I think, I don't, I can't put words in his mouth, but he was, he was aware that you have the danger of agent provocateur in these sort of situations and that um, a peaceful protest can turn less peaceful because of say police violence, for instance. Um, it's hard to say where he'd stand on Colin Kaepernick. I, um, you know, I, I kind of hope that he would see that sort of protest as appropriate. I think a lot of folks who do civil rights history all about Art we would hope that Art Fletcher would support that. But he also had this, this sort of flag loving streak of patriotism that maybe he would have said that that's not the best way to go about it. I think he certainly would have supported Kaepernick's right to do it that way. He would not have gotten into this nonsense of you need to fire this person for, for that sort of, for taking a knee for Pete's sake, which anyway, as an athlete, Fletcher knew that taking a knee is part of things that you do, you know, the coach will take a knee so he could make announcements or she could make announcements out of it. In terms of the 2021 unrest, of course, Fletcher rec would recognize this for exactly what it is. I mean, this is the takeover of the Republican Party by the forces of anti-civil rights. Um, and, uh, and this is something, you know, when, when he, if he were to be watching what's going on within the leadership of the Republican Party today, he would say that this is exactly what I've been warning y'all about for the past 60 years. You know, this is what I've been telling you we need to be fighting against. We need to be standing up for what this party stood for in 1960. We need to be standing up for what this party stood for in 1860 um, and, and be willing to risk our political careers for it. And boy, oh boy, did he risk his political career again and again. And he often, he often found, you know, years and years and years of being out of the, you know, or out in the wilderness, I guess is the way to put it even after that, especially after that incredible kind of rags to riches 1960s moonshot story, uh, you know, there's a time when Nixon shunned him and then there's the time that this person shunned him and that person shunned him. Uh, and so I guess that's, I hope that's the way he would have addressed 2020-21, but not with us anymore. So. Answer. <clears throat> Uh, I think, let's see, we have a question up and this might be or have to be your last one as we're running a little bit out of time here, but we've had some really great questions. Um, so how involved did Arthur Fletcher stay in the affirmative action debate later in life? So this was his, I, I, I think he saw it as his claim to fame. And he was quite regularly calling up television and radio news outlets, calling up print news outlets, writing them uh, and saying, hey, there's an affirmative action debate going on and you might want me to be part of it. Uh, you know, uh, he called himself the father of affirmative action enforcement. He didn't go so far as to call himself the father of affirmative action. Um, and, uh, and so he, he wanted very much to be part of the discussion. And every time there is kind of a flare up uh, most notably, I would say in the 90s, um, when Ward Connerly began pushing to end affirmative action at the University of California, at all, public, at all public institutions in California. And then, of course, when Bob Dole um, publicly turned against affirmative action in 95 during the initial stages of his 1996 run for president, um, Fletcher became very, very active. In fact, he ran for president uh, actively for a few months in 95, early 90, not even into 96, because he didn't make it onto any ballots. Uh, so in the fall of 95, he was a candidate for president as the affirmative action Republican candidate. 
just really, he knew he wasn't gonna win. I, I hope he did. <laughs> I, I don't think he was that naive, um, but he never admits that. He never admits that he knew he wasn't going to win, uh, but um, he didn't stand a chance, but he was trying to get the story out. He was trying to say, this party can stand for affirmative action. It's okay. And, and we can have that within the Republican Party. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gollin. This has actually this has been a really fascinating uh, presentation. I enjoyed the read as well, so I highly recommend the book to others if they're looking for uh, a figure that they've not heard much about. <laughs> um, this, <laughs> yes, there you go. But great, thank you so much, Gleaves. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Dave and Brooke and all our viewers who contributed to an enlightening evening. I sure learned a lot. And those who tuned in will no longer have to say that Arthur Fletcher was the most important civil rights leader they've never heard of. And if you want to buy Dave Gollin's book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, and he just held up, uh, learn more about Fletcher's remarkable contributions to the American experience, visit Amazon.com. And I want to thank all our partners at the Ford Presidential Museum, as well as the Friends of Ford, who make our programs possible. If you enjoyed this evening and value such programs for raising the level of our civic discourse, especially now when Americans seem so divided over race and ideology, please consider becoming a friend of Ford at our foundation's website. The web address is on your screen. We have a membership drive through the month of February so that when you join at the $50 level or higher, you will receive artisan chocolates to share with your Valentine so just go to the web address on your screen and sign up. Also, tune into a very exciting program exactly one week from this evening when we partner with the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies to bring my good friend Bill Barker back, this time virtually, to West Michigan. Bill comes to us from Monticello and will be performing as Thomas Jefferson, who struggles mightily with the legacy of slavery to which he contributed. And after all, the irony is, he's the author of the line in the Declaration of Independence all men are created equal. Well, until next week, thank you again and good night.